I'm Megan Nakashima. I'm one of the hematopathologists here at the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm gonna run through a bone marrow case with you today to hopefully talk about a few interesting diagnostic points. So we'll start with the clinical history. Our patient is a 67-year-old man who's had thrombocytopenia for several years, sort of moderate in the 60 to 100 range. Um, he also recently had an unintentional 27 kilogram weight loss. And he has hepatosplenomegaly, intermittent diarrhea, and some lymphadenopathy. He actually had a bone marrow biopsy performed three years before, and that was considered non-diagnostic for his cause for his thrombocytopenia. So just going through his hemogram, his WBC 5.3, hemoglobin fairly anemic for a man at 9.8, and again, moderate thrombocytopenia at 62. Um, looking at his differential and his peripheral blood, you'll notice um, neutrophils on the slightly lower side, um, as well as lymphocytes, but then 28% monocytes and 20% eosinophils, which gives us an absolute monocytosis and eosinophilia over one times 10 to the ninth per liter. Okay. So looking at his peripheral blood, right away you can see that there is a predominance of monocytes in, up here and eosinophils. And I think some of this vacuolization is probably just because this blood might have been a little old when this slide was made. But you can sort of see that these monocytes have abnormally condensed chromatin, a little bit coarse, also kind of abnormally lobulated nuclei. And then in these eosinophils, you can see that this one has a hypolobated nucleus. And there's also some unevenness to the granularity. Again, that could be seen with an older slide. Uh, here's a slightly lower power view of his bone marrow aspirate. Um, you can see a large uh, spicule here, so this is a very nice sample. And then up here, you can start to see some abnormalities, including these are actually neutrophils, so they're quite hypogranular. Uh, we do have increased monocytes as seen here. Again, some increased eosinophils. And then it's slightly hard to see, but um, this is a eobaso, so basically an immature eosinophil that actually also has basophilic granules. We'll see a few more examples of that. Uh, moving up to higher power, again, you see an dysplastic neutrophil with hypogranular cytoplasm, uh, tendency towards hyperlobation of this nucleus, um, some abnormal monocytes, um, which sometimes can be difficult to distinguish as monocytes. I actually see with our trainees when they're starting off during their differentials that they undercount monocytes. But here you can see with the lobulated nuclei and kind of blue-gray cytoplasm. And here's also a, a monoblast. Uh, if you start looking around some more, in addition to seeing these still abnormal eosinophils with this uneven granularity, and this has three lobes as opposed to the normal two, uh, we also see some of these other strange cells with kind of uh, nondescript granules that don't quite resemble anything normal in the bone marrow. And we'll see a few more examples of those, as well as here's another eosinophilic precursor with basophilic granules. You can see these in reactive conditions, but they are typically seen in myeloid neoplasms, kind of the classic example is an AML with inversion 16 or um, M4EO as called in the FAB classification. Um, just looking around again, more monocytes. Here's another one of these atypical cells. Instead of the bilobe nucleus we saw here, it's kind of a reniform nucleus, but again, these sort of sparse um, granules in the background. Eosinophils, hypogranular neutrophils, um, and not too much wrong with the erythroid lineage that we can see. Uh, here's another example of one of these bilobed abnormally granulated cells, another eobaso, hypogranular neutrophils, and abnormal monocytes. So hopefully I'm showing to you some decent examples of dysplasia as well as there were a smattering of blasts, and then these kind of abnormal cells that we're still trying to figure out exactly what they are. Um, and just to really bring home that there is granulocytic dysplasia, here's a large neutrophil with um, true binucleation, and then, of, of course, hypogranularity of the cytoplasm. Uh, when we look at the bone marrow trephine biopsy, uh, for a 67-year-old man, this is quite hypercellular, probably in the range of 80 to 90%. Um, and you can see that the hypercellularity extends even into the subcortical region, where you would expect to see less um, cellularity. Uh, and you can also, I think, at this power, begin to appreciate that these uh, megakaryocytes, which we didn't see on the aspirate smears, are also abnormal, with sort of hyperlobulated uh, nuclei and almost staghorn uh, nuclei in some areas. So here's another closer look at those um, abnormal megakaryocytes, and as well as you can also see um, the eosinophilia 
in the background. And if we look throughout the entirety of the biopsy, there is this one little patch of cells here on the edge. Um, there were a couple more, but this one was the best one. Um, and it, it can be a little easy to overlook this. But if you go closer, you can see that these are quite abnormal looking cells for the bone marrow. And in fact, they almost, you can see how they correspond to those cells we were trying to name on the aspirate smears. So we have some with sort of reniform nuclei, some with bilobe nuclei, some sparse granularity in the cytoplasm, and fairly abundant cytoplasm. So it turns out that when we stain these with immunohistochemistry, these are actually positive for mast cell tryptase. Um, they're also positive for CD117, as mast cells typically are, but they aberrantly express CD25. Uh, when we looked at the bone marrow uh, reticulin stain, there's mild increased background fibrosis consistent with these um, dysplastic megakaryocytes being present. And so what are we thinking about in the differential? So we know that we started off with someone who had uh, systemic symptoms and then also cytopenias as well as some cytoses, right? He was anemic and thrombocytopenic, but also had increased eosinophils and monocytes. So when we're talking about eosinophilia in the context of myeloid neoplasms, there are a few different potential diagnoses that we really have to think about in order to get the right tests. Um, so one of these diagnoses is the relatively new category of myeloid or lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia and recurrent translocations. Another one is AML with inversion 16 or translocation 1616, which I sort of alluded to before. And then another one is systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm. And the reason it's important to keep this differential in mind is that for this category, for example, you have to order specific fish testing. Uh, AML with inversion 16, you will often pick up on karyotype, but it can be very subtle. So some, in some cases, you might want to order fish for that as well. And then just keeping mastocytosis in mind, you might want to go back and do your immunohistochemistry for tryptase and 117 like we did here. So having said that, we did this full workup. This karyotype came back as normal male. Uh, we did fish for these different translocations, all of which were negative. And we did do next generation sequencing for genes commonly mutated in myeloid neoplasms and found variants of known clinical significance in KIT, SRS2, F2 and TET2, and then a variant of unknown clinical significance in RUNX1. Um, so this is the typical kit mutation that we associate with mastocytosis. And so the diagnosis here is systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm, which is chronic myelomonocytic leukemia-0 of the dysplastic type. And so just to go back and kind of show you that this is what atypical mast cells will look like in the bone marrow because they look so different from normal mast cells that I think unless you've seen this before, you wouldn't really think that these could be mast cells. You might think that they were abnormal basophils or something. But here's another uh, example where you have the bilobe nucleus and this really sparse granularity, sort of more like basophil granules than the typical mast cell granules, which you know, are usually darker purple and completely fill the cytoplasm. Here's an example where you're starting to see a little bit of spindling of the cytoplasm of this mast cell. And here's another one with a sort of a reniform nucleus and this abundant cytoplasm with the sparse granularity. And then here's one with even more abnormal um, granules. And you, these can sometimes even be sort of blast stage type mast cells. OK, so we have a couple things we can talk about. Um, the first thing is just systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematological neoplasm, which is actually a new name for this entity. It used to have a longer uh, name in the previous version of the WHO, so this is actually somewhat of an improvement. Um, and so basically, you have to get to a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis, uh, the criteria for which hasn't really changed a ton, and then also have another hematologic neoplasm. So to make a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis, you have to have either the one major criteria plus one of the minor criteria, or you can have greater than or equal to three of the minor criteria. So the major criteria is to have uh, basically multiple aggregates of mast cells, and they have to be at least 15 mast cells in each of them. Um, and then the minor criterion is to have uh, greater than 25% of your mast cells either be spindled on the um, histologic slides or appear atypical and immature on the aspirate smears. To have the kit activate a mutation at codon 816, typically the D816V that we saw in this case, 
mast cells should show a barren expression of CD25. And the revision in 2016 says it can be with or without CD2. So CD2 by itself, based on that terminology, is not um, good enough, basically. And then you can also have elevated serum tryptase. But it's important to note that that's not a valid criteria if you're talking about an associated hematologic neoplasm, because a lot of myeloid neoplasms actually have elevated serum tryptase on their own. So in this case, we did have multiple aggregates of mast cells. Um, and as you saw, it was greater than 15 mast cells. They are quite immature, both on the aspirate smears and the core biopsy. We did have the kit mutation, and then they were positive for CD25. I actually personally have stopped doing the CD2 because of the way they've rewritten this criterion. Um, although, you know, it's kind of nice to look at if you want to. Uh, the one thing you have to remember when you're interpreting these stains is that they will be positive. CD2 will be positive on basically all your T cells, and CD25 will be positive on a subset. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at that stain compared to a tryptase or 117. Uh, next generation sequencing is something that we're seeing increasingly done on a lot of bone marrow biopsies in different scenarios. And it turns out that that can actually be kind of helpful to help you not overlook a mastocytosis. So this was a little study done at the Brigham and they went through their NGS panels and found 22 cases of kit mutations and when the panel was done for suspected hematologic neoplasm. And basically all the cases where the diagnosis of that bone marrow was either an MDS, an MPN, or an MDS-MPN overlap neoplasm fulfilled criteria for concurrent systemic mastocytosis. And interestingly, nine of those had actually not been diagnosed on initial review. So it actually is important to catch this kind of secondary diagnosis, and we'll see, especially in this case, that ended up being his more significant problem almost in the long run. So you really want to be able to diagnose the mastocytosis component so they can also receive treatment for that. When they saw kit mutations in their AML cases, there were fewer, only about half of them actually had systemic mastocytosis, and interestingly, they were the non-816V mutations. Okay, so moving to the other half of our diagnosis, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, or CMML. These are the basic diagnostic criteria in the 2016 revision of the WHO. You must have persistent peripheral monocytosis greater than one and greater than 10% of peripheral blood cells. You cannot meet criteria for any of these classical myeloproliferative neoplasms. You can't have rearrangements of these um, genes that are associated with the eosinophilia that we'll talk about later. Um, you can't have greater than 20% blast because then you're just AML. And you classically, because it's an overlap neoplasm, want to see dysplasia in at least one lineage. Although if you don't see overt dysplasia, you know, which we did have in this case, if you were to find some kind of chromosomal translocation that was not one of these or BCR able, or if you found something that wasn't a significant clonal abnormality in your next generation sequencing panel, you know, like our TET2 and our SFSR2. Or if you don't have any of those things, as long as you've had monocytosis for greater than three months and you've excluded all considerations for reactive causes, then you can basically go ahead and make this diagnosis. So I just wanted to point out a few changes that occurred with the 2016 revision. And one of those is this uh, requirement that you have to have greater than 10% monocytes in the peripheral blood. So it used to just be this absolute number, but now you also have to have the relative monocytosis. They've also added in a few classifiers because it turned out that this actually does change how these cases behave and somewhat in what type of prognosis there is. So they divided them into the proliferative type and the dysplastic type, sort of dividing them between whether you're more on the MDS side or the MPN side. So the proliferative type has a WBC greater than 13. People with these types of cases tend to have more constitutional symptoms. And then the dysplastic type with less than 13 WBCs, and they have symptoms more related to the cytopenias. So that's sort of similar to our patient who was experiencing thrombocytopenia and then anemia. Uh, they also added the category of CMML zero. So uh, now that corresponds to less than 2% peripheral blood blasts, less than 5% bone marrow blasts, and no ARONs. And then CMML2 remains sort of like an MDS-EB2, where peripheral blood blasts are greater than or equal to 5%, bone marrow blasts are greater than or equal to 10%, and or you have ARONs, which pushes you into the higher category.
This was a provisional entity in the last WHO and has been solidified in the current revision and has its own chapter even. So these are the myeloid and lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia and gene rearrangement. Um, they are rearrangements involving PDGFR alpha, PDGFR beta, or FDFR1, or having this specific PCM1 JAK2 translocation. Like I said, for several of these, um, you want to do FISH specifically because, for example, the most common PDGFR-A translocation is cryptic, so you need to have FISH to even find it. PDGFR-B has multiple different translocation partners, so the recommended testing is to use a break-apart probe for this gene rather than a fusion probe. They all kind of have a variable presentation and kind of begin as an MPN, typically with eosinophilia, although they can also be um, CMML, like in this case with eosinophilia, or they can have a chronic eosinophilic leukemia. And basically, they all have the potential to transform into something acute. So either an acute myeloid leukemia, which makes sense when you're talking about a myeloid neoplasm, but sort of interestingly, also we have this component that some of them will evolve into a lymphoblastic leukemia or lymphoma. So that's where this part comes into the name. Um, it is important to find these translocations in part because these overall have quite a bad prognosis because they often do transform, but you also want to know which one is there because PDGFR-A and PDGFR-B rearrangements will be sensitive to tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, whereas the FGFR ones, for example, will not be. The PCM1 JAK2 translocation is the most recently described, so there's not as much published about it, but sort of follows the same pattern of presenting either as an MPN or an MDS-MPN overlap. So getting back to our patient, we actually went back and did mast cell stains on the colon biopsies, which I'll show you in a minute. He did get treated with nilotinib and azacitidine, so the nilotinib are targeting more his mast cell disease, potentially in the azacitidine for his CMML. Unfortunately, this was his bone marrow trephine after that treatment. So you can see pretty much the entire marrow has been replaced by this now more, much more spindled looking uh, infiltrate. And uh, I will say that I, I have seen cases of mastocytosis in the bone marrow misdiagnosed as granulomas. So it's always something to keep in mind when you see sort of these spindle type lesions in the bone marrow. When we did the immunohistochemistry, again, you can see that the majority of these cells are mast cells. Unfortunately, he did expire 18 months after his initial bone marrow biopsy. So I'm, I'm not a GI pathologist, but I'll show you the, um, the stains for the colon. Remember, he was having diarrhea, and that is something that you can have with mast cell disease because of the inflammatory mediators that are released. But it, you can also have direct tissue involvement. So here you can see kind of increased cellularity in the lamina propria. And then when we stain for 117, you can actually see that they are, in fact, some scattered mast cells um, that are aberrantly expressing CD25. And here's an interesting phenomenon that you have to keep in mind when you're looking at these cases is that actually in the GI tract, mast cells tend to underexpress tryptase, or they can. So you want to be sure to do your whole panel of immunohistochemical stainings if that's in your uh, differential diagnosis. Just wrapping up quickly, when you have mastocytosis in the GI tract, like I said, you can have GI symptoms even if they're not physically there. Um, but when it does involve the GI tract, it's most typically the large intestine followed by the ileum, duodenum, and stomach. Again, you'll see these little aggregates of either ovoid or spindled cells in the lamina propria, and they, it can be patchy and subtle. So for example, in this case, it actually was not picked up on h &E. And of course, IHC can be very helpful. So we, like I said before, we use CD25 as our marker for aberrancy and 80% might show decreased expression of tryptase, so you want to be sure to do your 117 also. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention.